Yes, okay, we are live now. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third session of Carvan Online History Festival. I'm Ishan. I'm the founder of Carvan, the Heritage Exploration Initiative. And today, I think I should thank my lucky stars to because I'm joined by one of Delhi's foremost urban historians, Professor Narayani Gupta. I always wanted to get an opportunity to meet her personally in Delhi, but I think due to COVID, we have to meet digitally. Professor Gupta is a name that we all are familiar with. Her scholarship in Delhi's history is remarkable. She taught at the Indrapas College for Women at Delhi University and then joined Jamia Millia Islamia University in 86. In addition to this, she has been the founder member of Conservation Society of Delhi, member of the Delhi Urban Art Commission, and also a con consultant with INTAC. So knowing the fact that you are here to listen to the wise Professor Gupta and not me, I think I should give the mic to Professor Gupta. Yeah, over to you, ma'am. Thank you. It's you I have to thank, Ishan, for giving me this opportunity to concentrate on something in a time which is particularly difficult. And uh, I realized one thing as I was putting down my ideas that you can't escape into history because history always impinges on the present and the other way around. The present impinges on history also. Yeah. So I'm going to um, look at uh, different aspects of what I think we could take further about uh, how you look at a city. Um, if you think about it, celebrating or the opposite, which is composing a lament for the city, is something that has been done in certain situations. But who has ever defined a city comprehensively? Its characteristics, its physical features, above all the connectedness of landscape to human beings. It may be really described as a situation of the six blind men and the elephant. Each person dwells on a different aspect or specific element of the city. If you think about it, years can go by with no reference to a particular city. Then suddenly a celebration or a tragedy erupts and even people very far away get to hear about it, see some visuals and often now with the miracle of television, they see it while it is happening. In the last half year, Delhi has been in the news over successive issues. This, I'll just list them as the four that occur to me as more significant. The Central Vista project, which is still a matter of debate. The protests against the CAA, the violence in Northeast Delhi, and now the pandemic. Suddenly, we have all become familiar with different parts of the city. Rajput and the Bhavans and the Indira Gandhi Center are things that most of us probably knew. But Shaheen Bagh, Silampur, where a large part of Delhi's population live, is something that many middle class people never even got to see or needed to see. The highway to UP and the tramp of hundreds of feet which kind of echo through the night in our minds as we sleep. Crises, the break with the daily humdrum, shocks and unsettles. But then it gives pause, helps us to evaluate relations between humans and physical landscapes, which is after all what we call urban history. The affected groups are seen in categories referred to in terms which are sometimes emotive, sometimes newly coined, some are self-referential, some are pejorative. Sadness, impatience and doubt color our reactions to and the interpretations of happenings, contemporary as well as historic. Many generalizations gloss over details and don't bother to make connections. I have written so glibly and confidently over the years about similar situations lodged in the past. 
the discussion on the design for the British capital at Delhi in 1912, the protests against the Rowlett Bill in 1919, the communal riots of the 1880s, the plague epidemic in the 20th century. Those were easy, but I could not describe the happenings of the last six months either glibly or confidently. If you think about it, history is a layered process. When history is evolving around you, there is a four-stage process of transmission. Information may be compiled by officials, the statistics of people at a rally, the dead and the wounded, uh, of provocations and retaliations. Then these are conveyed in user-friendly or user-acceptable language to the lay reader or the listener. But does it really help us to understand? A stage later, the scholars come along and provide the scaffolding for generalizations. This tidies up themes, puts them in little boxes, but it still does not always explain. Simultaneously or later, creative individuals convey moods, the action, the atmosphere. City descriptions or visualizations can arouse very strong emotions of elation, of grief, in readers and viewers. There is power in the pen and the brush or the camera. Cities are celebrated or mourned by writers, poets and artists. There was a time centuries ago when scholars like Ibn Khaldun of Egypt compiled gazetteers of the cities of the known world and there were those who wrote poetically about cities, their grandeur or their devastation. The compliments they paid to the cities are almost like the panegyrics they wrote for the uh, rulers. But many of them convey a standalone sense of appreciation of the beauty of the city itself. There has been a magic to cities which make them timeless. You can listen in carefully to the voices in the ancient world from Sumer and Egypt through the Greco-Roman world in the early centuries CE when Sangam poetry rings through even in translation in very compelling images. The Shilapadikaram conjures up the grandeur of the city of Madurai. But uh, this is only the tip of an iceberg lost to us. Where physical remains survive, old towns are catalogued as archaeological sites. They have already been through revivals. Remember, I mean, a lot of time has passed between their being populated and now, and in between they have been revived, reused, reinterpreted. And we are seeing them at a second remove or third remove. Now, what I want to spend a little just a few minutes on, is the period that most attracts me, which is from what is called the early modern, from the 16th century to the 20th. Here we see a satisfying continuity and an abundance of artifacts, buildings, text, visual representations that we can relate to. The historian David Ludden has observed that from the medieval period, which I'm calling early modern, we see a tradition of historical civility, an aesthetic and a tradition of wisdom that became as much a part of each civilizing state as its armies, capitals, monuments, and administration. These are the latter ones, the armies, capitals, monuments, and administration figure in all our textbooks. The first, the aesthetic and the traditional wisdom, rather reluctantly added later, not enough. In Europe and, the, and in Western South Asia, there are wonderful examples of the cosmopolises that uh, cities were, that were linked by merchant guilds and by shrines and places of worship. They were aglow with the display of wealth. You can smell the roses of Vijayanagar when you read about it. They were islands and seas of forest or desert connected by well-maintained highways where no identity cards were demanded, 
where the stranger was made welcome. Barriers of language were not insurmountable. Differences of religious cults did not create deep aversions. The European visitors remarked on this and said that it was amazing how everybody was curious about other people's religions and beliefs instead of regarding them with hostility. As travel, this is in more recent times, for work or adventure or for pleasure increased exponentially, so did descriptions of towns and comparisons with others, anthropomorphic portraits, attributing qualities, wondering at the skills with detailed accounts of architecture and gardens. Today, we miss all that. Maybe the effortlessness of clicking a photograph has made word pictures superfluous. From the 16th century, there is, we can notice this all the time, there is a continuity of place through till now. We worship in the same Jama Masjid as did Shah Jahan. We look out from the same Jharokas of the Hawa Mahal as did the Jaipur princesses in the 18th century. This continuity creates an aura and a shared pleasure. When translated into works of art and pen pictures, it is possible to make conjectural reconstructions. The material is most abundant in European countries. And what is available in India has begun to be analyzed and interpreted over the last half century. I'm sure there will be so much more done in the coming years. And um, sorry, um, I was thinking of examples like uh, how much you can get out of the miniatures of the Mughal period. There's so much more to be drawn out from them. And I just want to give you this little example, which charms me. The idea of Jahangir wanting to have himself painted, standing on the globe, the Jahangir. A few years after Jahangir's death, you have Vermeer in Holland, born a few years after, who painted a thoughtful scholar studying the globe. That was Europe's discovery of the world, that the world was round. Monumental architecture, which is always with us, is seldom depicted in paintings in India, sadly. I mean, we have no contemporary views of any of the Mughal buildings. You get them, get pictures of them only after the Europeans came and went tranced and kept painting them feverishly. You contrast this with a man like Canaletto in the 18th century in Venice, who drew canvas after canvas, uh, uh, showing the canals of Venice, the busy town hall, a city live and throbbing, very prosperous with trade. You get the sense of the people's city so vividly. And earlier there was Tintoretto, who also did the same city. So, these were things that excited them to the point of them wanting to have huge canvases depicting it. In India, in the same 18th century as Canaletto, the great leveler was the street and even more so the gadi, the lane, the uh, smaller streets, becomes a favorite theme for poets as uh, the same time as London and Paris of the ordinary citizen started to be written about. So the cities not of the rulers, but of the people were being recognized and celebrated. Laments, laments for the city destroyed in classical and vernacular languages, inspired by historical events, are common to many countries in the Mediterranean and West Asia. Aisha Jalal talks about Sheher Ashob when she uh, is talking about modern India in, as the way that the poet locates his existential self through attachment to a Vatan. So there is a very distinct quality to the Sheher Ashob of the uh, subcontinent 
because these were laments for the city and it was something everybody could empathize with. Mir's manner of introducing himself at the court of Lucknow, linking himself to Delhi, Delhi jo ek shahar tha, alam mein brings this out poignantly. In Delhi and Lucknow, ravaged in 1857, poets burst spontaneously into verse. All seemed bleak, but as usual, the cities recovered. Now let's come to more recent times. From the 1930s, you sense that coming events were already casting their shadows on the streets of North Indian cities. Now it is prose or fiction rather than the escapism of poetry that very powerfully conveys a sense of helpless distress. This homesickness lasted many decades and even now some of us may be familiar with people for whom it has not quite gone away. There's a lovely story about the Pakistani artist Ejaz Anwar who came to Delhi and had an exhibition of his paintings in 1997. Now remember, 1997, that's not that long ago. This is after the Babri Masjid. There were tensions in India, which we should were very much aware of at that time. But here was this artist from Lahore coming with a huge collection of watercolors showing the streets of Lahore. And later he wrote in his, on his website, for me, that exhibition in Delhi was a very unique experience. Most visitors were octogenarians, old Lahoreites. They were not regular exhibition goers. They were not necessarily art lovers. They came for the sake of Lahore. I have the comments book at home and they wrote such remarks in Urdu. When I remember those days, my heart breaks into smiles. Some of them came every day. And there's one old man who would sit beside me all day. I had brought the flying kites, you know, the Patang of uh, the Patang festival in uh, which upload in Pasant in Lahore. I had brought the flying kites to decorate as part of my signature of old Lahore's pay, uh, old paintings. I did not know, he said, who said that Basant is a festival of the Hindus? It is a festival of Lahore. Cities for many of its inhabitants may not have been their Vatan, but it was their place of work. And if this was jeopardized, if their jobs were jeopardized, they often moved on. This was something that very long ago, in 1526, struck Babur when he arrived in Hindustan. He wrote with considerable surprise about the swiftness with which a city could be deserted as well as it could be rebuilt. In the century, after 1757, when the East India Company was on the rampage, conquering large swathes of India, there was a sense of distress in many areas. We have descriptions of Karnataka villages where the Wulsa took place. The Wulsa is a word to explain how the villagers fled in anticipation of attack. And with them, they carried the thatches of their roofs so that they could set up a house somewhere else. In 1857 to 58, during the Great Revolt, many individuals left Delhi and Lucknow and moved to the capitals of other kingdoms. In 1947 to 48, there were many who went to Pakistan out of curiosity to see what it was like. And they planned to return. They had left their things behind. As always happens, those who had occupied their homes did not welcome them back. There are two great writers who passed on, whose home had been in Shah Janabad, Delhi. Ahmad Ali and Intazar Hussain. They could never get Delhi out of their persona. Ahmad Ali died a very sad man in Karachi. 
and in Tazar Hussain loved talking about his home in Delhi, all that he could remember, he was a child then, was that it was in a gully where are we to look for the Sam Kaped? The city seen in anthropomorphic terms should not be forgotten. My supervisor, uh, 55 years ago, gently chided me when I used the word feel in my essays. Historians do not feel, she said, they think. I don't know whether I entirely agree. Towns also have to be felt. They are sites of experience, adventures, accidents, and they have to be conveyed to others and to later generations with hamdardi. How else to understand the way Sher Asho, composed two and a half years ago, still can, two and a half centuries ago, can still tug at our heartstrings? We may be reading about the experiences of others, but we also are ham suffer in the journey. Cities should be read not only in terms of highs and lows, but of the web of interactions. An example from a book which appeared recently, uh, Amita Baviskar, the sociologist, finds meaning in the little details of urban life. She narrates in a way a kasida to the everyday. Now, let's just move on to the 19th century, when the sense of the cosmopolis was affected by colonial rule. There was a marked change from this time in the way Indian cities were perceived, first by Europeans and then by the Indians themselves. Europeans, bewildered by what was happening in their own cities, remember, they were being politically charged by revolution. Every now and then, Paris saw the barricades and the people up in arms. All class divided by industrial expansion, when cities like Manchester and Birmingham exploded with and became uh, hideous places, with the skies darkened by smoke, with people squashed into small homes, with uh, disease and uh, general unhappiness being distributed all over the poorer areas. These Englishmen coming from that background uh, noticed those features in Indian cities, not an industrial town, but what they call the native town, a phrase you don't get with the earlier writers. They saw these as dirty, prone to epidemics. The disdain was internalized in turn by upper class Indians. Class prejudices were unselfconsciously expressed. You find this even today. And many copied elements of European lifestyles. The sense of religious identity, which was something that the outcome of government policies and of the categories in the census of majority and minority also began to gnaw away at the cosmopolitanism that had been the hallmark of the cities. Urban inhabitants did not have to fear an invading army anymore, but they were subconsciously often afraid of a mob of their fellow citizens getting out of hand. These began as sporadic, untidy acts, but have now come to be well organized, aided by technology. The accessibility of technological know how across the globe has brought urban scholars together, but it's also enabled others to tear cities apart. The cosmopolis that was the hallmark of Indian urbanism will return, I'm confident, but it will have to be through a different medium. Non-threatening older cities pose no threat. They survive as ruins or in texts, and they are valorized as spectacle, as archaeology, ancient history. This perception, oddly enough, created a distinction between the historic, which was seen as magnificent, and the modern, which is seen as a difficult place to inhabit. Just as Iraq 
was always seen as a different entity from ancient Mesopotamia when they were the same place. In the last hundred years, that is in the 20th century, impersonal administrators have come to occupy the widening space between the enumerators and the panegyrists, geographers and planners increasingly dealing with cartographic images on their computer rather than the city itself, medical practitioners looking at the city at the site of malaise, we see this so much now, security agencies, lawyers happily settling or prolonging endless border disputes. This should make city life in cities easier, but no, it is the troubles that keep increasing. On the web, of course, we should exercise due caution, but I found 103 crore entries for the term urban problems when I keep that in. So towns and problems go together. These are the minutiae of long-term malfunctioning, which is inevitable when the city belongs to nobody in particular. The ineffectiveness of the law of tort in India is telling. There are celebrations in the city, but these are often to please a political functionary or a popular cultural or sports idol. These are performed in designated venues, <clears throat> but the city itself is not celebrated. In this respect, the UNESCO recognitions to our sites, World Heritage Sites, is a way of sort of giving, drawing notice to the city. And they also have a category where, for instance, Chennai is now known as the city of music, which is a wonderful notion. It gives you so much scope for your imagination and a sense of pride and well-being. Um, it's interesting that the other category of the UNESCO, which is World Heritage Cities, not Sites, Cities, does not have any takers in India with great, after a long, long time, Ahmedabad has been designated a world heritage city. But India, which has such a large number of heritage cities, has not put up any others for this nomination. Whereas countries like USA, which are really Johnny come lately, I mean, 200 years of their history, have been able to uh, have a large number of their own cities uh, nominated and accepted. So this speaks for the attitude we have towards our cities, which is that we are concerned with how they go ahead and become smart cities rather than cherishing their past and helping it to become part of the present. In independent India, where city government had its components of planners, the areas which were densely populated were defined as slums. This was an American terminology, part of American terminology. And uh, another phrase which came into use only after independence was to call old towns walled cities. Often there was no wall, but they were referred to as that. And later, another American term, inner cities. Earlier, when the uh, large number of people from the provinces of Pakistan came and relocated in Delhi, they were called refugees, which they certainly were not. You cannot be a refugee in your own country. And the label stuck. Over time, people have come to accept without a murmur terms like EWS, e economically weaker sections, BPL, below the poverty level, how would you like to have those terms attached to your name, to your Russian card? What does it do for your ego? I've had our students saying we have to design a house for the EWS category. Have they stopped to think about what they're talking about? JJ clusters referred to shacks that were built by squatters from the rural areas. When they are given uh, tiny little flats to live in. These are called JJ colonies, Jugi Jumpri colonies, which is a contradiction in itself. When housing was embarked on, these have been permanently labeled HIG, MIG, LIG, Janata, again, harping on your income category. 
In the last few months, the term migrant is being used to describe a category of people who happen to have homes in the village to other them. The term is not a defining one because it is equally valid for many of us who are better off townsfolk. Even where the physical distance between villages enclaved in cities and new urban neighborhoods is very small, they inhabit completely different worlds. The orientation and social distancing are defining, sometimes reinforced by uh, barriers and walls. This term social distancing that has been used now is really correctly uh, indicated would be physical distancing because social distancing has become part of our lives. The urban middle class is a term which has been coined in the early 19th century in Britain to define a new category of entrepreneurs. And in India, it is used for better off migrants, mobile and white collar jobs based in towns. Families living in colonies and cities are largely homogeneous in terms of income and profession, in some cases, ethnicity, and increasingly of religion. In the case of the last, the recognition of sectarian signs are recognized rather than the number of common factors. I'll just read out a short excerpt from a student who happens to be a Muslim who's doing research for a PhD, where she talks about um, the discourse of homeland and the realities of partition not only demarcated space on religious lines, but also established the notion of Muslim dominated areas as being exclusionary and contested. These turned out to be the pockets where the dominant idea of the nation had to be engineered, materialized and practiced. Consequently, they were looked at differently over a period of the 1940s as Muslim dominated areas uh, to be administered for communal peace in the 1950s as Muslim zones that needed to be protected, in the 60s as isolated, unhygienic cultural pockets to be clean and Indianized, in the 70s as locations of internal threat, the mini Pakistans that were to be dismantled. After 1857, while in North India, poets were mourning the, the, the cities they had loved, in Western India, the city triumphant Copies of those in Europe were creating completely new skylines. It's very uh, easy to see the similarity between Bombay even today and London. They both are, uh, their skylines are largely built in neo-Gothic style over the 19th century. Colonial civic architecture financed by the Indian rich became symbols of the city triumphant. The princes, assured that they didn't have to fear a British attack, also commissioned picturesque city centers and public institutions. It was a period of civic celebration, as had been the reign of Akbar in all of North India. It culminated in the 1920s with the inauguration of the only planned city that the British built, New Delhi, and with the majestic Umayyad Bhavan of the Jodhpur Raja. The sociologist, biologist, uh, he's got very many other terms that can be used for him. Patrick Geddes, who saw India in the 1920s, saw much to celebrate. Not monumental civic buildings, but, and this is important for Indians then and now again to understand, what he celebrated was the organic spaces created by people near water bodies or by a banyan tree. He interacted with professionals and intellectuals who were very cordial to him and went along with him, but they never thought to transfer his ideas into action. It is telling that in the 1920s and 30s, the reports he wrote about Indian towns, more than 40 of them, were the pride of the library of the Calcutta Improvement Trust, but his ideas fell off the radar totally thereafter. The two world wars left Europe and Japan with many ravaged cities and the fierce determination to rebuild them. In India at the same time, independence awoke dreams of new cities and Chandigarh, New Bhavaneshwar and Gandhinagar followed. This obsession with building grand capitals continues. Today, Amaravati is hanging in the balance, um, but this seems to be totally acceptable that you have to have 
um, as soon as you are a separate state, you have to have a very spectacular looking uh, city center. Grand capitals do satisfy some hunger for grandeur, as de Gaulle said in France. Beyond that, given that cities are drawing in many rural hopefuls, the question was what the ideal city would be. The town planning ideology in the Western world in the 19th century projects an ideal city. Now, this makes sense in the virgin territories of North America, but not so in India, because we already have traditions millennia old of urbanism. If they wanted to modernize old cities, the examples to turn to would be not the US, which has had been, but Italy or Germany. The DDA, in perfect faith, absorbed the principles of American town design, which is a cocktail of classic colonial planning, which is on the grid, and the principles of, um, uh, sorry, and the simplicity of Bauhaus, the German school. With one word, the planners in Delhi reduced the iconic city of Shah Jahan to a slum, an appendage to Greater New Delhi. Shah Jahanabad, which some Italian students rather engagingly described as a pomegranate with little slots, with little sort of um, stump areas demarcated clearly for 600 mohallas, which had a security mechanism a hierarchy of thoroughfares and of vehicles, open spaces against hierarchically disposed. This, these were seen as settlements to be embarrassed about, ideally to be allowed to decay and be replaced by high-rise towers. I would like to just at this point pay tribute to Pradeep Sachdeva, who passed away recently, who has had begun and hopefully it will be seen to its conclusion, uh, the redesigning of Chandni Chowk to try and get back some of the quality of the city that Shah Jahan built. But by and large, people are sold the American dream. And there have been many cases of the older generation who moved from there to the houses in South Delhi, and they sat in the spl empty splendor of a South Delhi flat and fantasized about the sights and sounds of the Sheher, which they had left. Jubilees are celebrated, and cities have jubilees. In the 1990s, the three presidency cities, Calcutta, Bombay, Madras, celebrated their 300th birthday. The mode of celebration is usually to recall political heroes, not the city itself. In a tradition where, which has never honored architects as artists, I think it's something that we should think about. It is the patron who's remembered, not the craftsman. The revolution in 16th century Europe when artists and craftsmen came to be named individually did not happen in India, even if Mughal miniaturists like Basavan were honored in the writings of Abul Fazl. The idea of the artist or the architect is celebrated in the Vishwakarma Puja by the people who belong to, as they see themselves, to the faith or to the caste, but not individual uh, architects. The visual aspects of cities, therefore, is not appreciated as um, being created by individual genius. It's different with the poets. Ghalib is in, equally applauded by the Rais as well as by the Tongawala. Museums and monuments should be great equalizers and on occasion can be. In uh, 1989, when there was a great argument about whether to destroy the canopy at India Gate or not, and it, uh, it went in favor of the canopy and it stayed, um, was one such, um, because everybody came together to protest. Maybe there will be a day when the people of Delhi will rush out to save their museums the way the people of Florence did in 1966, when there was a major flood in the city. Cities have been constantly modified and these should be intelligently appreciated. Um, they have been repeated opportunities for creating inclusive urban communities, but unfortunately, municipal councillors today see themselves in a very limited fashion as political beings. 
I have a sense that the Mohalladars of the pre-modern city had more individuality, more kind of sense of kinship with the Mohalla they were associated with. Perhaps this could be somehow brought back. Urban architecture is bifurcated into that of the past and of the present. That of the past is easy to celebrate. The latter is not realized because we're still using it. <coughs> I find it interesting that in 1984, some citizens in two cities, Lahore and Delhi, twin cities separated in middle age, formed conservation societies. Neither of them was aware of the other. The 1980s was the heritage moment. It is now a familiar issue, sometimes contentious in many Indian towns and is extended to awareness of public spaces, water bodies, building techniques. This has to be strengthened and must be extended to more recent times and not only the distant past. There is another thing I would like to just uh, suggest to you that we keep track of. Um, in the US in the last 20 years, there has been a slight change, a, a track change. The USA cities now want to be different from those whose features we've written about, or written into our own town plan, plans and principles. The local, for the first time, is being valorized over the national, the neighborhood over the city. The celebration of the city is no longer the gloating over gigantism the tallest skyscraper and so on over massive expenditure, but the return to the small scale and the human. They had an inspiration. There was this wonderful book written by Jane Jacobs, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, published in 1961. Sanity does win, though it may take half a century. All cities do not have to die the examples of Chicago in the 1900s, of Glasgow in the 1990s, show that blighted cities can reinvent themselves. The Great Plague and Great Fire in London in the 1660s were tragedies that led to the rebuilding of the city. Out of our present crisis, what's going on now at the moment in India, maybe we will build new cities. Cities should be sites of opportunity. Every war is followed by reconstruction. The COVID catastrophe should change the landscape of the subcontinent. We should ponder from now on the changes which could make ours a happy country. So far, the future of our cities has been left to experts. Maybe this is to change. The flight from the cities in the last two months has been a rejection of the cruel city to which the rural folk have come, eyes lit with hope. It is a natural subject for an outpouring of share our show. Instead, it was met with deafening silence. This will go down as modern India's darkest moment, with an occasional glimmer of diyas lit by citizens carrying food packets. The human tragedy does not allow the luxury of writing poems. Remedial action should be in direct, not inverse proportion to the scale of the need. Whom can we invoke at this point? I just uh, remembered Corbusier who said that a great architect was not someone who designed a massive complex, but who could design a tiny and beautiful dwelling for the poorest man in the city. The, now I come to um, ending my uh, presentation. So the last little boys who sell pirated books under flyovers are the potential makers of the new cities, but only if they're allowed dignity. Catastrophes, natural, man-engineered, will recur. But just as they do not discriminate between rich and poor, nor should we. It's worthwhile thinking through the four flashpoints I had listed and identifying uh, the connections between them. You should work it out for yourselves. Just as in 1789 in Paris, three separate developments led to the crisis. The unoriginal belief that power is worth praising, uh, whether in monumental architecture or the privilege of a majority, and reducing the heart to Delhi to a dried out shell is something that we should be concerned about. What emerges from this churning should be the cosmopolitan spirit 
of 17th century Hindustan, which earned for it the admiration of so many visitors from far off lands. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for ma this very thought provoking lecture. Uh, I had a question for you before we end this session. Like, you know, for, for the past few decades, there have been some cultural changes in the city of Delhi, for say. There are new cultural centers emerging, there are more urban centers emerging in the city. So, how do you see this change? in the city in the last few decades, like the introduction of IGNCA or for say the Jashne Rekta celebration that celebrates the city and the language of Delhi. How do you see that? Well, actually, uh, I'm glad you made me turn to something positive because maybe I sounded too bleak. Um, you're absolutely right. These changes have in the last um, 30 years or so, I would say, people, one small thing is that I hear more and more people say, I belong to Delhi. In my generation, we always <laughs> refer to our mother tongue. And I would have said I was from Kerala, which I have nothing to do with. I live in Delhi and so on. So that is a major change. And I think that accounts for a lot of positive actions that people have taken, particularly young people in recent times. I'm so glad you pointed that out. That's very important. The other thing is that culture has, uh, in the sense of presenting old and new cultural, um, I mean, either classical culture or new emerging um, ways of presenting the music or art and so on, all of these are being very positively uh, accepted. In fact, Delhi was a rather dull place earlier in the sense that um, people may have been interesting, but in the large gatherings or in large uh, cultural venues, the elite culture of the VIPs occupying the front rows and so on was very prominent. It's not so now. Now, thanks to social media and the general kind of awareness, there is a patron people are pa who are patronizing these uh, things are from all ages and all categories. So that's really something to be happy about. Uh, so you have written in one of your columns published in the Indian Express on 19th February that Delhi was a very bureaucratic city. Then it emerged as a cultural city. But now with this uh, Central Vista project, do you think we are going back to those days of bureaucracy, you know, doing much of the Delhi thing? Um, I wouldn't. Let me put it differently. Um, I think the notion that uh, the most central point about is the capital should be the bureaucrats who obviously have a huge role to play as the, uh, being employed by the center and uh, therefore running the country. I mean, it's not a Delhi space. It's a national space, the central vista. This has to be remembered. There is a Delhi's problems are that the national and the local uh, over uh, overlap very much. Okay, so if we regarded that central vista as the capital, uh, the uh, property of the nation, we should think of what is the most stunningly beautiful thing that you can present there. And to my mind, the most beautiful things in India are the things that have been crafted or painted or written. I mean, these are things of the mind and the hand which should be celebrated. Government offices need really good office space, very modern ones. I can't agree more. But they don't have to fill up the main center of the city. Because the amount of interaction people in those offices will have with the outer world is limited. They will be doing their own work. They'll be communicating with each other. And if the present plan goes through, they will be communicating by walking through tunnels underground. They won't even come out onto the surface. So it's a very strange landscape, which I find difficult to visualize. Um, if you think of all the central vistas, if you like, in other countries like Washington or Canberra, they have made it a point to put their best feet forward. And so 
people who visit the city can come there just as they used to go to Lal Kila to see the wonderful architecture of Shah Jahan. They should come here to see things. And our country is just so full of beauty. It's so amazingly, you know, various and uh, thing. I mean, I think it would be hard to even find, um, you know, enough space for all the various categories that you can have there. So it should be a series of things which interact with the people and uh, in, uh, encourage them to come there. Uh, so uh, there's a question by Gaurav Chauhan. Yeah. He asked, that, do you think we have, a ba we have a balance between preserving and celebrating our cultural past and focusing on science and technology? Why is that we are so ignorant when it comes to our culture and past? Uh, sorry, why are we so ignorant about the culture? Is that what you're saying? And yeah, and we are emphasizing science and technology. Yes. Uh, let me just have a look. Okay. All right. Um, I think this is something that can be addressed at the school level very easily because science and technology don't have to be lonely stand apart subjects. They can be, they can come into it. After all, even in art, there is science. Even in architecture, there's very much uh, the role of science is very important. And more and more people are dealing with these now. I mean, I know that you had a lecture by Sohail Hashmi. I don't remember what his topic was, but he's very good at bringing out the aspects of architecture, which have a scientific uh, kind of base or scientific um, intelligence to it. And I, uh, things like uh, conservation of water and you know, if you read about Harappa, for instance, and you uh, instead of just giving you the facts about it, just think of how they preserved water in the desert um, landscape and how forts were built in the medieval period, what the, uh, what the British, the technology they introduced, you know, everything can be fitted in uh, given its um, context and so on. So history doesn't have to be rather dull political history standing by itself and science and technology again separately. And I think there is an effort being made now to do this with textbooks. And not simply to say the old, uh, the people in early times knew everything. That's not the point, but that at each stage when you have something coming in to be able to talk about it. I hope that answers yeah. you. So thank you very much, ma'am, for your time yeah. and for this wonderful lecture this evening. It was really <laughs> like a dream come true for us to have you. <laughs> and I think I missed out that uh, she was one of the inspirations for me to take up history in my bachelor's. Yes. So thank you very much, ma'am. It is so nice to have you. Thank, thank you, everyone. This slide. Mm -hmm.